Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the last study of this current week. As we again return to our study in Daniel 11, <clears throat> shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his direction and guidance so that we may more completely understand that which he would have us to recognize at this time in earth's history. Shall we now ask for his guidance in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for Theodore's safe return and for this time that we may spend in study, in worship, and in, with communion in, with others. Help us now so that your will may be done so that our minds might be opened to understand the truths that you would put before us. Direct us now. In all things, we ask for your guidance. Help us as we open your word. May your spirit open our minds, for at this time in earth's history, we, mu we much need you. Forgive us of our sins and send your angels to protect us, to surround us, so that your will is done. Direct us now in all things guide us so that we might more clearly understand that which we are to present to others for this father we thank you and we praise you in jesus name amen now brief recap as we were looking the other day and i will share my screen here in just a second we were looking at a at, at a situation just in the in the overall detail We'd had a chart that Brother Stephen had presented that was showing how the 1290 and the 1260 were so very interrelated with the founding of Rome. Now, we were addressing the Battle of Pharnacles, where the army of the Roman Republic, led by Pompey, was defeated by the armies of Julius Caesar after which Pompey fled to Egypt and was murdered by Ptolemy. The date of this battle of Pharnacles on the biblical calendar was the 10th day of the fifth month. As Brother Stephen pointed out, that's very significant for us because the 10th day of the fifth month, as we are shown in Jeremiah 52, 12, was the date of the destruction of the temple. Now, we've been looking at a lot of these articles by Smith, and we've been surprised to find how many times the biblical calendar, the rabbinic calendar, and the Islamic calendar, during the times of the publishment of these articles, had lined up. Now, in our situation, excuse me, I, I call it Pharnacles, it's Pharsalus. The Battle of Pharsalus was the decisive battle of Caesar's civil war and was fought on the 9th of August of 48 BC. This battle was fought in central Greece. However, 10th day of the fifth month being the day of the destruction of the temple in 586 BC, now we have the Battle of Pharsalus also on the 10th day of the fifth month in 48 BC. And as Brother Stephen pointed out, this occurred 538 years after the destruction of the temple. Now, that was the discussion um, two days ago, right? Correct. Okay, yeah, because I did listen to half of that video, but I didn't, I didn't get a chance to look at yesterday's. So, um, so that was rather interesting. So the 538 years, which we tied to uh, 538 BC, which on the 1843 chart is the year for the fall of Babylon, which is the Jewish year 538, uh, the civil year. So Babylon fell actually on the 16th day of the seventh month, 16 days into the Jewish civil year 538. Right. So, okay. so, so we have that. We also, of course, 538 AD. For the 1335 but uh so i didn't finish watching that so i'm interested to see what else came from that well the other the other points this in 48 bc was the 10th day of the fifth month on the biblical calendar 
It was also the 10th day of the fifth month on the rabbinic calendar, but it is also the 10th day of the fifth month on the Babylonian calendar. Yeah, well, the Babylonians can quite often align with the biblical, though not always. But yeah, so interesting. Now, uh, yeah, and so that 10th day of the fifth month, obviously, the destruction of the temple, both in 70 AD and 536. So it's going to be uh, 538 years from the destruction of the temple in 586. Okay. Right. So that means in 70 AD, because this is what, 48 BC? This is 48 BC. Yeah. So you would add 47 to 70. And what do you get? 117, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So 117. We know what that, that symbolizes July 18th. Well, I was also intrigued, and I'm still trying to put this together, that from 586 B.C., or excuse, we, if, we're, if we look at this, we have a span of 586 years from 48 B.C. brings us to the year 539 A.D. Yeah, well, that, that, uh, that's, inter- that's because, well, because we're just kind of doing things. So it's going to give us 539 AD. If you did an inclusive count, it'd be 538. Okay. Right. That's just because you BC and AD, they're going to just reverse there. Right. So, yeah. So that's, that's naturally what would happen because it's basically just the same math, but with, with uh, no zero year between BC and AD. Now, does that give us a chiastic structure? Yeah. Well, that's naturally going to occur. Right. So with that math, you're always going to end up with that. Because if you have 538 years between uh, 448 BC and 586, then if you go to the AD and you, you know, do it inclusive, it'll always end up. So that, and so, but that's what we're saying is the 538 BC and the 538 AD are connected as symbols. And so it's more the significance that it's 538 years from 586 to the Battle of Pharsalus, right? So that that's going to create that other connection because 538 BC and AD are both connected by a sim- the same symbol. Does that make sense? Okay. Because it could be any year. If you took any year BC and you counted the number of years between it, it, you know, to the destruction of Jerusalem. If you looked at AD, you'll get the same year in an inclusive count. But but it still has already tied those symbols together. It's just one other way of looking at it. So okay. when we were when we were addressing this, it was kind of a um, another confirmation of how the vision is established by Rome and not by Islam and not by Definitely not by Antiochus Epiphanes. Yeah, so I guess there was some kind of uh, discussion or something regarding, uh, I guess in, Jeff had discussed it or something regarding Rome establishing the vision. Um, Correct. <clears throat> what, so, so can you go into that a little bit more, What what's going on, if uh, if you understand it? Okay, from what I understood from the presentation on the American group's side mm-hmm. last Sabbath, on June, I believe it's June 29th. Yeah, June 29th. There were two points that Elder Jeff had addressed. One was to that a challenge had been made of his statement that when the the temple had been erected the second time, that the menorah, the seven-branch candlestick, had been changed to an eight-branch candlestick in use in the temple. And he identified this first as the apostasy of the Jews, and second, he was applying this as a symbol of Trump being the eighth of the seventh. Now, okay, so, 
Yeah, so the eighth, well, my understanding is that the eighth uh, branch menorahs is the, the Sabbath menorah. Just counting, you know, what little I know. It's just it counts, they count to the eighth day because that's, they're counting from Sabbath to Sabbath inclusive. The is eight that branch, right? <clears throat> okay, the eight branch menorah was, or the, the alternative menorah is what I'll call it had never been sanctioned for use within the temple. Right. It was sanctioned for use only within homes. Yeah. And it is not an eight branch, but a nine branch, because there is one branch directly in the center, and that candle is the one that's to be used to light all others. Okay, yeah. But there's eight eight days marked because you count Sabbath, and then you have you come to Sabbath again, and it becomes the eighth day. Okay, right? Is that how they they do it? That I cannot I I can't speak to that. Okay. My understanding is that this this alternative menorah was for use during Hanukkah only. Okay. So okay. They, so, so they count from they count from. One Sabbath to another Sabbath. And it makes it the eighth Sabbath, right? Okay. It's the eighth day. Is that what it is? Is that what y'all talking about? It makes it the eighth day. Well that that that's the menorah I'm familiar with. Um yeah, there is one for uh Hanukkah menorah, but I wasn't really thinking about that one. So I didn't I didn't realize it was different. Um shows you how little I know about all this stuff, but uh, okay. So, I apologize for so, so Jeff was so Jeff was wrong about it. What he presented, right? what the way that that Elder Jeff had presented this in the meeting on the 29th was that he had been challenged on this point, and the way that he stated, he said that there are times that he has been a loose cannon on things and he had done no due diligence to verify his information he just thought you know the jews were in apostasy we have this eight branch menorah and the this this is a perfect representation of trump and then he ran with it okay so So, that's the hanukkah menorah has the nine candles correct uh but there is an eight branched menorah there's always a center branch. There's not an eight branch. Okay, so there is never one. Okay. Okay, I see what you're saying. But, yeah, so the, the center one is just used to light them. Correct. Now, <clears throat> as we are aware, Moses, in the instruction given him from our Heavenly Father, had instructed that a seven-branch menorah was what was to light the temple. There is actually an eight-branch menorah without the the center one. Okay. Okay. I had not found that when I was researching. Yep, there is. So there's eight and nine-branch ones. But they are not using either of those two within the temple. No, they don't don't have an eight-branch menorah in the temple or a nine branch it's only the seven but he was saying that they used it in the temple correct so he just got yeah uh, because they did approve of of the branch menorah for Wait, use what i'm what i'm stating is that on his presentation on may 6th <clears throat> mm-hmm. he was stating that the eight branch menorah had been in use in the temple itself Right, which it wasn't, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So he said that when he was challenged and he did his due diligence, he found that this was not correct. Yeah, okay. Okay. Now the other part... How did that relate then to um, Rome establishing the vision? That was the part I didn't fully understand how they're connected. When when he segued from 
his retraction. He stated that he had had a telephone conversation with Brother Colin, and they had discussed that they have a, a disagreement regarding the King of the North, that Jeff has taken the position, as it has been presented by James White, that the King of the North is Rome. Colin was of the opinion that the King of the North is the United States. Well, he, they're making two different applications. So, so that's kind of interesting. So, I mean, because we know that the King of the North is the United States in our time, in the present truth application, but Jeff's not accepting that. Jeff was being very, very specific that just as others in the past had disagreed with Rome establishing the vision. And here he went back to the issues that occurred within the book of Joel. Mm -hmm. When Kevin Howard and others from California had come out to present that the four insects in the book of Joel were Islam and Jeff very correctly was stating that those four insects must be Rome. He noted that this led to a divergence and that these other ministries walk with us no more. Okay. Now we will stay though, say though that when Rome establishes the vision, Rome does establish the vision, even in the present truth context. Because that has to do with the rise of Rome, uh, the papacy in this case, in right. conjunction with the United States prior to November 9th, 2019. So, so Rome's going to come in. It's going to be part of what takes down the Soviet Union because the United States, the other part, but United States then becomes the king of the north, right? Along with the papacy. Well, Right. So the issue of who's the king of the north um, is a little bit different than Rome establishing the vision, because in Daniel, when Rome establishes the vision, it's not yet the king of the north. Correct. Well, because it, it comes in and supports Egypt, it doesn't become the king of the north until verse 16 of Daniel what, 11. What the, the point was that Elder Jeff was making. Mm -hmm was that at this time, it is most important for us to be able to understand clearly the verses of Daniel 11, 14 through 16, in order to have a complete and clear understanding as to who the King of the North is, but specifically who the robbers of thy people are. Yeah, so they're studying the same things we are right now. He is studying this, and this was his presentation. Yeah. Okay. And, and we would agree with that. What mm -hmm. he's not doing is he's not taking that um, and, and clearly marking uh, the connection to um, present truth because he has a completely different way in which he understands how we make the connections from that history to ours. Right? Correct. So so we we have some things, details that he would need in order to thoroughly understand that. But as far as the historical, we would we would agree. But does he connect the United States with being the king of the north in its connection with the papacy, being the armies of the king of the north? That's what well, I was going. That's what I was going to ask you. So the only time when the king, when the United States is the king of the north, is when it's connected to Rome, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the United States in, isn't in and of itself the king of the north. That's right. But but it can be. The king of the north can symbolize the United States, you know, in when we're taking Daniel 11, it's talking about the king of the north, the king of the south. 
it can symbolize the United States when we make an application to our time. Right, that's how. Right, but it has to, but it has to be connected to Rome, right? The papacy. Mm -hmm. So, in the in the big picture, Elder Jeff had stated that he and Colin had a telephone conversation and that they disagreed in these points, but he was applying this also to state that in the spirit of Philadelphia. Adventism, that they could have a disagreement with each other and be able to talk it out without one deciding that the other was completely wrong and that they were going to have to separate. So if you're part of the Philadelphian group, you could have disagreements and study things according to Ellen White's counsel, but if we're not part of the Philadelphian group, we can't do that. That seemed to be the premise he was approaching. Okay. He did not state that directly. Okay. Well, yeah, because, I mean, part of the problem is, you know, anytime anybody's had a disagreement, they just get cut off. And even when they're trying to do this in the spirit of brotherly love, you know, to, to understand the truth, disagreements haven't been allowed. It's been called disruptive. Even when it's not even truly a disagreement, it's just a discussion about something, trying to understand something. Correct. So that's kind of interesting that they now can have disagreements. So the hour and a half that he spent in the presentation was prim primarily addressing these verses, especially in reference to the robbers of thy people. Now he didn't he didn't understand of course the sons of the robbers of our people that 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 the robbers of our people technically are Babylon right? right so so the robbers of our people are not Rome it's the sons of the robbers of our people that is Rome correct that's that's what we figured out and and that that becomes really important because that ties us to that uh, 666 uh, years between the siege of Jerusalem when Jehoiachin is taken captive in 597 and the siege of Jerusalem by Rome. So you got Babylon and Rome connected. And that's Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. So, so that's the sons of the robbers of our, of, uh, of our people. Uh, that becomes really important, I believe, in understanding that connection. And, and it took us a while. It kind of evaded us for a while because, you know, it's not there in the King James. So it's sort of something that's been hidden that's now clearer. But but he doesn't really understand it's the sons of the robbers of our people, right? He doesn't get that connection. I don't recall that he addressed it as the sons of the ro of the robbers. He was very focused on the robbers of thy people. Right. Yeah. Which is what we always had been focused upon. Because, I mean, until you brought it up, I never noticed, you know, the sons of the robbers. I mean, there was, uh, you know, sometimes people would say the children of the robbers of our people. Right. But but I just always kind of ignored that. I just always focused upon, you know, whether it's robbers or breakers or destroyers or whatever. But... uh it definitely is connecting Rome to Babylon. That That's kind of the whole point. So it actually helps us understand the passage much more clearly when we when we see that connection between Babylon and Rome. And, and that's why they established the vision, right? Correct. Because it's connecting to the vision, dealing with, you know, uh, Daniel 7. Right, because that that's the vision that's being referred to in, in that whole context of Daniel chapter 10, 11, and 12 is, is that we have these different visions. And uh, so when Rome establishes the vision, that's the kazon. Right. And, and that leads us to Daniel chapter 7. So, I mean, this is an extremely important point that has taken us a long time to really get our minds around and part of that is just you know confirmation bias you know having the blinders on looking at something a certain way and not being able to see 
uh, how it's connected to something else. So I, I think it's it's a major point, Rome establishing the vision and how we understand they do that. But I don't think Jeff would understand that at this point. Did he address at all that it's the Kazone and what vision it is? He did not. Right. Because what we always you know, focused on is that Rome establishes the vision, right? That That's, you know, the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves and establish the vision. And even when we'd studied this before, until we got, you know, here this, this week, I don't, at least I personally never understood how that connection works. You know, we started a bit last week with, you know, dealing with these visions, the Kazone, the Mara, um, the, 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 uh, the Mara, and of course the Debar, which isn't vision, but it's, uh, the matter or commandment or thing, um, that these are the primary prophecies of seven, eight, nine, and then the last vision, right? The last vision right. would be Mara rather than the Mara, right? Which is, is Daniel. Eight, right. And so um, I did have a discussion with William Pitt regarding this this issue, which which is rather interesting, which I'm going to spend a bit of time talking with him about it. But, you know, part of part of this uh, this issue of, of these different visions has to do with what we call the second and the fourth. Right. So when we look at the fourth angel. Uh, we had this little disagreement over this, but it was just just a language. So Ellen White never calls it the fourth angel, right? Right. Um, now we call it the fourth angel, uh, and which which is fine, right? Nothing wrong with calling it the fourth angel. We also need to recognize it's a repetition of of the second angel's message: Babylon has fallen, has fallen, but because of you know, the Protestant churches have had a deeper fall, right? That fall has become complete. Um, it there then is the call to come out of Babylon, which doesn't happen with the second angel, right? Okay. The second angel's message makes nothing about come out of her, my people. That's Revelation 18. Now, the Millerites attached Revelation 18 to Revelation 14. That is, they just saw it was the second angel. Um, and so they, they just, so they said Babylon has fallen, fallen, come out of her, my people. But that actually, that call to come out of her, my people is really in our history. They, they misapplied it to their history. Correct. Does that make sense? I think so. Yeah. So, um, anyway, so this issue then of the second angel, uh, being in our history. It is the message of the second angel, but it is also the fourth angel, right? So there's a parallel between our history and that history. And so understanding that becomes really important in understanding these visions. So understanding the Mara, the looking glass, the mirror vision of the prophetic mirror, right? Which is, is the, the, the application to our time is understanding this prophetic mirror. So in order to have a revelation of Jesus Christ, we need to look at this prophetic mirror, right? We need to be able to see that. And, and I think, you know, so it brings some importance to the light that's come in our time. So, I, and, and, and this would be the problem with what's happened with, with Jeff and FFA is light has come in our time, but it's hard for them to distinguish what that light is because they don't have the framework uh, to appreciate the significance of it. And the problem that the Jeff had is how he created his line is he didn't realize it's a zoom into Ellen White's line, that Ellen White's line is the main line. Right. It's only that we have a repeat of history that we have our line at all. It's not you can't put our line into Ellen White's line. You can't have Ellen White uh, because, you know, she has the Sunday law. Revelation 18 is future. Um, and we're in the time of, 
of the angel of Revelation 18 since 9-11, right? So that's when the Sunday law commenced. But she doesn't have, you know, 9-11, midnight, midnight cry Sunday law because that's, that's just not in her line at all, right? She just has the Sunday law. But we zoom into that and then we see this history. So, so getting back to Rome establishing the vision, the only way that we understand this and can apply it in our time is understanding the lines, like understanding how we're repeating history. And uh, that, that becomes a bit of a problem with uh, uh, Jeff and FFA. They're not going to have the ability to sort through that because they rejected light. So, so anyway, yesterday we were going through several points. We ended here at verse 18. See if we can do a very quick recap. Yeah, because since I didn't see yesterday, but I'm pretty sure it's helpful for other people who even did or were there. So as we were addressing this, of course, this particular document was published on the second day of the 11th month, biblical year 2915, which agrees also with the rabbinic calendar and the Islamic calendar. But 211 in that order we we would also see symbolically as being february 11th yeah now did you say 2915 5915 okay yeah that, cuz that was confusing me sorry so in february 11th being stephen's birthday so. right now of course the next article was published on the ninth day of the 11th month on the biblical calendar and is also in agreement with the rabbinic and Islamic calendar. So we have the symbol of 9-11 there. Yeah. So most of the time you're going to find uh, once once the years line up, like once the months line up, uh, the Islamic, the biblical and the rabbinic, as we see, they're going to match up with the day. The only time that would differ is if the length of a particular month was you know 29 and 30 between the two that they wouldn't so in this period while this jewish year or biblical year is going they're 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 mostly going to line up right all three of them uh once you get past the um well with, with the islamic theirs aren't a strict pattern of 30 and 29 um right where the rabbinic and the, the biblical are 30, 29 for the first six months, and then they can vary after that based upon the moon. So, but yeah, in this period, starting in 1870, these had lined up. So once you get past this year, because here we're in the 11th month, once you get into like the next year, then uh, the rabbinic or the Islamic might differ. It depends where where the, if there is a leap month or not. If there is a leap month, then they would change. But if there isn't, they still would line up for a period of two years. Okay. Roughly. So just clarify. Okay. Now, okay, the question was asked in the chat. Could Caesar's defeat of Pompey at Pharnacles, I want to make sure I say this right, since Pharsalia, so could Caesar's defeat of Pompey at Pharsalia, the latter being the head of a Hellenistic state, represent Rome taking over the world in our time? How was Pompey the head, or, or how are you referring to this battle? Well, I said his defeat of Pharnaces, the Pharnaces. Okay, and, and where, when was this defeat? Uh, I'm not sure when it occurred, but I'm just asking whether it symbolizes uh, Rome taking over the end of the world at the end of the world in, in our time, because it's a conquest of Greece. OK. OK, so you're just, talking about Pharnaces of Pontius. So I, I was I was incorrect in, in referring to the battle of 48 B.C. This this is a king of a Bosporus, a, a kingdom of the Bosporus. Who is a monarch of Persian and Greek ancestry? Is this who you're referring to? Yeah. Okay. So I'm looking at this very quickly. Okay. I don't know. 
I think I'd have to look at this, you know, a lot closer because I know that his father was defeated by Rome in the third Mithridatic war. So I don't know if I have a direct answer for it. Okay. We began. Sorry. To recover. I just want to clarify this. So, so we dealt with the battle of Pharsalus before, right? Right. That's 15 years after Pompey's siege of Jerusalem. Right, that, that we have in there. And then we have, because we had connected it with Daniel 11, 23 to 24, where we dealt with uh, the Battle of Actium and the Battle of Pharsalus. Right. Now, you had another name for that battle? Your, I, I didn't, didn't hear, I didn't understand your question. I'm sorry. You have a, did you have another name for that battle? Like, were, you, were we conflating two different things? I was conflating two different things based on the question that was being asked from the chat. Okay, but is it just called the Battle of Pharsalus, or does it have? Yes. Okay, so there's no other name. So that other one, uh, which she had asked in the chat about Pharnakes, that's, is there a Battle of Pharnakes? Pharnakes is a king, and apparently his father, Mithridates. 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 Okay the sixth of Pontius. Okay. So, so that Farnakes is mentioned by Uriah Smith. Correct. And and he's referring to that King and you were confusing that with the battle of Pharsalus. Correct. Oh, okay. Okay. That's my fault. Okay. But is the battle of Pharsalus involved here because we were dealing with Pompey in the siege of Jerusalem. So it's still connected here somewhere. Uh, in these earlier verses, because we do connect it in um, even for a time, right? About 360 years. Well, here again, this was connected in this in this conversation <clears throat> by Smith. So when we we come down here into the third paragraph, where Smith states a quarrel having not long after broken out between Pompey and Caesar, the famous bottle. Of Fars, he calls it Pharsalia, and we call it Pharsalus. Ah, uh -huh. okay, okay. So that was that was the other word, yeah, Pharsalia. Okay. okay. So it's interesting that that Uriah Smith does mention this because when we went through this originally, um, I don't remember running into that in Uriah Smith's uh, thoughts on Daniel, right, in the commentary. So that's his commentary on verse seventeen. Correct. <clears throat> so 11.17, which uh, is a symbol for July 18th. And then, so he's going to have, I'm just going to see here. Let me see. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it doesn't look like he mentions this. Um, but I'd have to look through. Yeah, so he doesn't mention it in the book Thoughts on Daniel. <clears throat> it's only here in his notes. It's here in his original article. Yeah, his original article. So so that's interesting because we had already found that battle, calling it the Battle of Barcelos. And and we had connected it with the, even for a time. So it's interesting that he brings it in here. <clears throat> now, specifically, um, if you look at this verse then, yeah, I need we need to look at this a bit more closely because we were dealing with this whole thing of he shall give him the daughter of woman corrupting her. Right. She stand on the side, not even for him. Right. So uh, and we had looked at that and we had, had a different interpretation. We looked at different ways in which we could understand who the he is and who the him is and who the daughter of woman is. And so we probably need to go over that. So did you go over that again and. We started on this. Okay. So, okay, give the summary again, and then we're probably going to have to spend a bit of time going over this clearly next week. Okay. So as we were, as we were walking this through, we read verse 17. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom, the upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, but he shall give, and he shall give him the daughter of women, corrupting her 
but she shall not stand on his side, neither be for him. Smith here again, making use of Bishop Newton, states Bishop Newton furnishes another reading for this verse, which seems to express more clearly the sense as follows. He shall also set his face to enter by force the whole kingdom. Verse 16 brought us down to the conquest of Syria and Judea by the Romans. Rome had previously conquered Macedon and Thrace. Egypt was now all that remained of the whole kingdom of Alexander, not brought into subjection by the Roman power, which now set its face <clears throat> to enter by force into that country. We ask the question if this, you know, if we had any issue with what we were seeing here. Well, I, I don't think so. I mean, that seems correct. Okay. So that's, I mean, I mean, definitely the whole kingdom here has to refer to with, with the strength of his whole kingdom. So that is to take over. The goal is to take over the whole kingdom. Right. Now, they're not going to address here the upright ones, but that's going to be the Jews. He's, it, it's going to come a little bit later in his. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So here again, Ptolemy Eliots died B.C. 51. He left the crown and the kingdom of Egypt to his eldest son and daughter, Ptolemy and Cleopatra. It was provided in his will that they should marry together and reign jointly. And because they were young, they were placed under the guardianship of the Romans. The Roman people accepted the charge and appointed Pompey as guardian of the young heirs of the throne of Egypt. Then he comes into this to state that a quarrel having not long after broken out between Pompey and Caesar, the famous battle of Pharsalus was fought between the two generals. Here again, my question was, since Pompey was leading the army of the Roman Republic and Caesar was leading his own army, is this not a type of a civil war? And yeah, I mean, this, yeah, this is, this is the civil war that happened. It's um, understood as a civil war uh, by some of the, the the documentaries I've watched. And some call it Caesar's civil war. Yeah, that's usually how it's referred to, Caesar's civil war. Yeah. Okay. So I think there's definitely an application to our time here. Exactly. Pompey being defeated, fled into Egypt. Caesar immediately followed him thither. But before his arrival, Pompey was basely murdered by Ptolemy, whose guardian he had been appointed. Caesar, Caesar thereupon assumed the appointment which had been given to Pompey as guardian of Ptolemy and Cleopatra. He found Egypt in commotion from intestine disturbances. So would we say that this battle between Ptolemy and Cleopatra is another type of civil war? Okay, so so that's the civil war within Egypt itself. Yes, within the king of the south. So, I mean, this becomes very interesting as far as making a present truth application. So we have this civil war in the United States. But the question is, do we have a civil, civil war within the Democrats? Is, is that how we would look at it, or would we look at it as a civil war within you know, uh, the whole group of what we would call globalists. Well, okay, let's, is there a civil war within the Democrats? I think that it's, it is fomenting at this point. Yeah, well, especially since that um, uh, infamous, uh, what they call a debate between Trump and Biden, where now finally, the wool that was pulled over the eyes of the American public regarding Biden's uh, degenerative mental condition, um, his Alzheimer's, dementia, has been lifted. I mean, it's pretty hard for somebody to not recognize. Because if you were just watching the mainstream media, you're not going to see uh, how badly Biden had deteriorated. They couldn't really hide it in the debate. No. And, and then the question is, was the reason this debate was so early so that Biden could be unmasked, so that Biden could be removed and somebody else put into his place? There's different theories about what's going to happen, whether 
Biden will even be on the ballots uh, when the election time comes because they haven't they haven't picked, but they haven't had whatever you call that convention or whatever, right? Well, the the convention is going to be this next month. Yeah. So so prior to the convention, he's not he's not officially the candidate, right? That's correct. And so this may be a way of exposing him and then either him resign or or they just pick someone else at the convention as the candidate because they so, still do that, right? That is quite correct because at this point, and let's, in, in order to look at this historically. Okay. 1968, you had a sitting American president that had the opportunity to run for a second term of his own. And that was Lyndon Johnson. Mm -hmm. Now, Johnson made the decision not to run in 1968. This opened up a major battle. Who was going to replace Johnson? The Democratic primaries that year favored Robert Kennedy. He died in June of 68, Mm -hmm. being murdered in Los Angeles. When they held the convention, there was great battles that went on at the time of the convention. And that convention was held in Chicago, just like the convention will be held this year. Okay. Coming out from that convention was a very weak Democratic Party behind Hubert Horatio Humphrey. Humphrey was defeated by Richard Nixon only because there was a third party candidate running that year by the name of George Wallace. Wallace took votes away from Humphrey and some away from Nixon. Mm -hmm. Now, there are other historical applications of other sitting presidents that basically were not found to be a you know a a good fit at that time but 68 is the is the year that that comes most easily to mind yeah okay so um so with the convention i mean biden could endorse someone else right 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 so i mean anybody could become i mean it could be michelle obama you know i mean there's all kinds of people uh or the newsome guy um, that could become the candidate for the Democrats instead of Biden. But most of them right now, with the exception of Michelle Obama, are not shown as being strong enough to defeat Trump. Right. But of course, Michelle Obama might look strong enough until she actually has to, uh, you know, do political stuff. <laughs> well, as, she's, and, not, she's never she's never been really a politician she's just no. been to a politician at and this at this point um the current vice president is definitely seen as not being strong enough yeah yeah I, well i realized that uh, gavin newsom the uh governor of california he's very much a fringe player very much like jay Inslee of washington so the the situation right now is that that Biden's cognitive abilities are coming to the forefront. People have seen that without a teleprompter, without someone talking to him, speaking in his ear, Joe Biden cannot hold a cogent conversation right. or stand for himself in a debate. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, he's basically now a child intellectually. Intellectually, you're being kind. Yeah. Yeah. So so obviously something's going to happen. I, I'm pretty sure Biden's not going to be running against Trump. It will take a bit for him to be replaced. I'll give you that. Yeah. But but it would have to happen. So so it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, but as far as this parallel, then, you know, we're, we're saying that there is a civil war within Egypt. Uh, so Ptolemy and Cleopatra becoming hostile towards each other. And we know Caesar's going to come in there in that situation. Um, you know, how, how would we 
symbolize Ptolemy and Cleopatra within Egypt? Well, the the point as we as we went further in this paragraph, mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll come back to your question. Yeah. Caesar, okay. Caesar thereupon assumed the appointment which had been given to Pompey as guardian of Ptolemy and Cleopatra. He found Egypt in commotion from intestine disturbances. Ptolemy and Cleopatra having become hostile to each other and she being deprived of her share in the government. Notwithstanding this, he did not hesitate to land at Alexandria with a small force, 800 horsemen, 3,200 foot soldiers. Take cognizance of the quarrel and undertake its settlement. The troubles daily increasing, Caesar found his small force to be insufficient to maintain his position and being unable to leave Egypt on account of the north wind, which blew at this season, he sent into Asia, ordering all the troops he had in that quarter to come to his assistance as soon as possible. And that's going to be the time in which uh, Caesar, Julius Caesar, connects with Cleopatra. And he's going to go into Alexandria, and then there's going to be all that stuff that happens. Uh, Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So I've studied this history. He explains it a little bit differently, but but it's the same history. That's all I just wanted to clarify. Okay. Okay. In the most haughty manner, he decreed that Ptolemy and Cleopatra should disband their armies, appear before him for a settlement of their differences, and abide by his decision. Egypt being an independent kingdom, his haughty degree, decree was considered an affront to its royal dignity, at which the Egyptians, highly incensed, flew to arms. Caesar replied that he acted by virtue of the will of their father, Aleuts, who had put his children under the guardianship of the Senate and the people of Rome, the whole authority of which was now vested in his person as counsel, and that as guardian, he had the right to arbitrate between them. Okay, so we had looked at this before. So Aletes. Aletes. Yeah, and uh, um, so this is something which Caesar had claimed, but there was it's it's disputed whether that actually was true. Okay. Right. Do you remember that? Uh, I'm just going to accept what you're saying right now. Yeah. I don't so remember what, what I remember is is that Caesar made this claim. And it was based on sort of a rumor um, that wasn't really proven, but that was that was the reason why he believed he had this authority that uh, that Ptolemy Aletes had had. But but yeah, it's hard to know. People have uh, disagreements regarding exactly the veracity of what uh, Caesar was claiming, whether it's something later that was uh, promoted as being true uh or whether you know so whether caesar just made this up you know there's disputes about it um so we're gonna have to look into that again because that that becomes an important point um caesar's authority so so what we have here is we have uh, caesar and pompey in a civil war which represents something in in with the united states itself but then we have a uh, a man and a woman, right, in Egypt, right, figuring out, well, what does that symbolize um, in that civil war that was happening? And that it's going to be Caesar that's going to try to uh, resolve that civil war in Egypt. But of course, it's to his ends. So, yeah, this, this becomes a really interesting, especially at this time, you know, parallel. It so, does. Yeah, so we really have to understand how this applies uh, historically and how it applies presently. So as we went through this, the matter was finally brought before him and advocates appointed to plead the cause of the respect of the respective parties. Cleopatra, aware of the foible of the great Roman conqueror, aware of his weakness and his his weakness here that she was aware of was his sexual appetite. Mm -hmm. Judged that the beauty of her presence would be more effectual in securing judgment in her favor 
than any advocate she could employ. To reach his presence undetected, she had recourse to the following stratagem. Laying herself at length in a bundle of clothes, Apollodorus, her Sicilian servant, wrapped it up in a cloth, tied it with a thong, and raising it upon his Herculean shoulders, sought the apartments of Caesar. Now, the comment that I made here, Apollodorus, the name meaning the gift of Apollo. Right, Doris, just like in Theodore, it's, you know, Theo is God, uh, Doris, there you get the Theodore, it's just a different ending, is gift, right? Okay. So again, it's just Apollodorus, so it's the gift of Apollo. Yeah, But he is Sicilian. Yeah, which is Italian of some sort from Sicily. Right. It's from the, the Isle of Sicily, which is the island at the boot of Italy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we know Sicilians, you know, because a lot of the mafia were Sicilians and stuff like that. Oh, now, now, are, are we going to type, you know, give typology to our Sicilian brothers? <laughs> <laughs> okay. But the thing is, yeah. Here is a Sicilian bringing a Greek, because the heritage of Cleopatra is Greek, to a Roman. Is there anything that we would see that with this? I know. Lay it out for us, for our simple minds. Well, I mean, Apollodorus, being a Sicilian, <clears throat> is an Italian. Yeah. So you have an Italian bringing a Greek woman to the representative of Rome. So a church. Correct. Yeah. So this Greek woman, this Greek, th this representative representation of a church is now coming before Rome. Yeah. So the church is seeking to have alliance, alliance with the civil power. Yeah, so in this case, Caesar is, is the civil power. Correct. Um, the woman is a church, which, which, which in this case is, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, it's Egypt, right? But it, it's still a woman, it's a church. So I'm not sure specifically what church, how we would look at that. But it's, it's Greek. So she's a Greek woman, right? Right. You know, it's Egypt. So, so I mean, this, whether we would look at this as, I don't think we would look at this as the Protestants in this case. No, I'm look, I was looking at it as spiritualism. Yeah, that's the way that I would look at it. So it, it's this spiritualistic religion. So uh, is this. Can you say it's wokeism? You could. But I'm I'm asking if it's spiritualism reaching the hand to grasp Rome. Okay. Now we know it's in, in Ellen White's illustration, it's it's the United States that reaches its hand. But of course, that means if it's going to grasp hands, the other ones have to reach their hands as well. Correct. So, so in this case, um, as far mm -hmm. as we have the, we have the Roman power. So is the Roman power represented by the Sicilian servant? Is that or is that would that be the papacy that's that's involved? Is this mediator, this gift of Apollo? Is that referring to the papacy? That's, that's the point I have not considered. But what were you asking, William? I was just thinking that the UN would be joining hands with the papacy. Would that be yeah. something to consider? Yeah, but, but we have Caesar here representing, uh, I mean, this is, is pagan Rome, but he, he's going to be representing the United States, the civil war within the United States. So you got Caesar and Pompey in a civil war. And would Caesar represent the Republicans or would he represent the Democrats? What about Pompey? I would almost think that Pompey would be representing the Democrats. Yeah, that's the way I would have looked at it. And Caesar representing the Republicans. Correct. But then within, so, and, 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 and Pompey does later become connected with Egypt. 
Okay. Now, the question asked again in the chat, just to, as it was yesterday, gift of Apollo, the sun god being a representation of the Sunday law. Apollo was not the sun god. Apollo was the god of war. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that, that I could fully agree with that question. I mean, it's worthy of consideration, but I, I just don't know, you know that I would agree with it. Yeah. So, so just getting back to the Civil War that I'm asking about, yeah, because I don't know if I agree with that. But so you have you have Caesar and Pompey involved in this Civil War. Now, uh, Pompey's going to die when? 48 BC, and this is occurring after the death of Pompey. So this is after the death of Pompey that you have the Battle of Pharsalus. No, the ba the Battle of Pharsalus takes place before the death of, of Pompey. About 40 days before. About that. Okay. And then, so then this is occurring at this time. Is Pompey dead? That's what I'm asking. Yes. Okay. So he's dead. So, um, so exactly where we would place this in, in time within the U.S. When did this, because that means the civil war within the U.S. would have ended? Be ongoing. But no, excuse me, you're right. The civil war within the U.S. would have ended because now Caesar has defeated the army of the Roman Republic and has now become the council that has a, the ultimate authority over Egypt. Yeah. Now we're okay. dealing with the civil war within Egypt so the question is, is this the civil war within the Democrats or a civil war with the wokeism? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, this doesn't necessarily have to follow chronologically. I mean, we could have the civil war in the United States just being representative by the civil war or Caesar's civil war. And then this would be a separate sort of civil war. Doesn't necessarily follow after, but... Yeah, it's, it's it's something we're really going to have to consider to try to understand this. Right. Um, but this is still something sort of future that happens. I, I mean, it still could happen in connection with the Sunday law. Right. It still could refer to that history. But, you know, Polydorus doesn't represent uh, the, the, the sun god. But, uh, huh. Okay, so keep going. Okay. We still have a lot to think about. So... Claiming to be to have a present for the Roman general, Apollodorus was admitted through the gates of the citadel, entered into the presence of Caesar, and deposited the beautiful Cleopatra at his feet. Caesar was far from being displeased with the stratagem, and being of a character described in 2 Peter 2.14, the first sight of so beautiful a person, says Roland, had all the effect upon him that she had desired. And there's quite a bit that we did talk about from 2 Peter 2.14. Caesar at length decreed that the brother and sister should occupy the throne jointly according to the intent of the will. Pothinius, the chief minister of state, having been principally instrumental in expelling Cleopatra from the throne, feared the re result of her restoration. He therefore began to excite jealousy and hostility against Caesar by insinuating among the populace that he designed eventually to give Cleopatra the sole power. Open sedition soon followed. Achille, at the head of 20,000 men, advanced to drive Caesar from Alexandria, skillfully di disposing his small body of men in the streets and alleys of the city. Caesar found no difficulty in repelling the attack. The Egyptians undertook to destroy his fleet. He retorted by burning theirs. Some of the burning vessels being driven near the quay. The quay. That, that one word has got so many different pronunciations. Really? Yeah, it does. Several of the buildings took the city, uh, of the city took fire, and the famous Alexandrian Library, containing nearly 400,000 volumes, was destroyed. 
Okay, so it should be pronounced key, I guess, eh? I'm that's the way I've heard it, but yeah. again, this this is a, a pronunciation that I've heard more with the in, in the British vernacular than I've ever seen in American English. Yeah, quay, it's sometimes pronounced that as well as well. So K or key or K or quay. But originally it was pronounced key. And it used to be spelled K-E-Y. Right. Okay. So that's interesting. But, uh, you know, from a, you know, a geeky sort of way. Okay. Okay. So the war growing more threatening, Caesar sent into all the neighboring countries for help. A large fleet came from Asia Minor to his assistance. Now, how do you pronounce this man's name? Mithrid- Mithridates? Mithridates. Mithridates set out for Egypt with an army raised in Syria and Cilicia. Antipater, the Idumean, joined him with 3,000 Jews. The Jews who held the passes into Egypt permitted the army to pass on without interruption. Without this, the whole plan must have failed. The arrival of this army decided the contest. A decisive battle was fought near the Nile, resulting in a complete victory for Caesar. Ptolemy, attempting to escape, was drowned in the river. Alexandria and all Egypt then submitted to the victor. Rome had now entered into and absorbed the whole of the original kingdom of Alexander. Now, here again, in addressing Antipater, one that is against the father, and the fact that he was Idumean, or he was of descent of Edom. An Edomite. Edomite, which means he was a, uh, a direct descendant of Esau. Mm-hmm. But this Antipater gave rise to Herod, because right. he was his son. Mm-hmm. So as we as we were speaking at the outset of today's study, by the upright ones of the text are doubtless meant the Jews who gave him the assistance already mentioned. Without this, he must have failed. With it, he completely subdued Egypt to his power, B.C. 47. The daughter of women corrupting her, the passion which Caesar had conceived for Cleopatra, by whom he had one son is assigned by the historian as the sole reason of his undertaking so dangerous a campaign as the Egyptian war. This kept him much longer in Egypt than his affairs required. He spreading, he spending whole nights in feasting and carousing with the dissolute queen. But, said the prophet, she shall not stand on his side nor be for him. Cleopatra afterward joined herself to Antony, the enemy of Augustus Caesar, and exerted her whole power against Rome. Okay, so just a couple of things here. So as far as how Uriah Smith understands this, Mm -hmm. he doesn't, so when he says he shall give him the daughter of women, going back to that, who does he have the he and who is the him? Is it he um, that is, is he having the daughter of women being Cleopatra. That seems to be the way he's approaching it. Because he doesn't explicitly state this. So then he, who's the he that gives the daughter of women? Now we know to him, he would then have that be Caesar, but he doesn't say specifically who the he is. The he is that tacitly referring to Ptolemy? But Ptolemy doesn't give Cleopatra to Caesar. I mean, it could just refer to, I don't know, because Caesar, because uh, Cleopatra gives herself to Caesar. Right. So, yeah, um, but I'm just not clear on how he's understanding this, right? Because he doesn't really address that specifically. Right. Uh, yeah. So there's lots here to, to look at. I mean, uh, I got to get my mind around it again. Um, been busy. It's obviously nice to be back in Canada. It's a little bit surreal. Um, and then, uh, 
you know, so tomorrow night I got the study. Going to resume the studies. We're going to be looking at uh, the evangelical conferences back in the 1950s. But um, so this area of study, we're going to have, I'm going to have to have time to look at that before Sunday. But uh, so I guess I'm sort of caught up and hopefully this is all making sense to people watching because you know, uh, there's a lot of information here and we've gone through it before, but every time we go through it, we notice something else. And so what's happening in the news, uh, I think becomes really relevant uh, in this context and also what's happening with FFA, what they're discussing. Okay. okay. So can you wait? Okay. <clears throat> we have come to the end of our time for today's study for this week. Do we have any other comments or questions? Just one, one little point, uh, just on the date today. So, of course, it's uh, Independence Day. In America. Yeah, in America. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's also uh, the 27th day of the third month on the biblical calendar. Okay. Right, so that March 27th symbol, Levite symbol. And then uh, on the Mayan, it's uh, 11, 12, 13. So it's, well, 13, 0, 11, 12, 13. just thought that was kind of interesting. Um, but uh, that's anyway, that's my only note there. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for spending this time with us and helping our minds to be open to the truths of your word. We pray for your direction today. Show us, Father, that which you would have us to understand. Guide us so that that which we do today may bring glory to your name. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.